Does Habakkuk's name mean wrestler or embracer? We can't think of this name without Jacob coming to mind. This prophet wrestled out his problems with Jehovah, but in the end discovered what Jacob learned at the fords of the river Jabbok. That blessing doesn't come by wrestling with God, but by clinging to him. Habakkuk has a unique approach among the minor prophets. Instead of taking the thoughts of God to the people, he takes the thoughts of the people to God. The author has six questions for the Lord in the first chapter, addressing the seeming indifference of Jehovah. He asks, why doesn't God hear me and why doesn't he do something? When God responds that he will be doing something and will use the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, to do it, the wrestler steps back into the ring. How could God justly use a more wicked nation? The Chaldeans to chase an Israel, he asks. Aren't the Chaldeans already slated for judgment? How can you even look on such a wicked nation? And don't you know that their reputation for such total destruction, they'll annihilate Israel. In chapter two, Habakkuk withdraws to his watchtower and awaits the Lord's answer. It's much like Peter's answer to those believers suffering now. Judgment must begin at the house of God. This includes five woes to remind us that if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? 1 Peter 4.18 But in the end, the Lord calls on Habakkuk to live by faith. There's no sense in turning to the kind of idol god the Chaldeans worship, because even though it's overlaid with gold and silver, yet he says, in it there's no breath at all. Instead, Habakkuk needs to remember that Jehovah is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. God is not answerable to us, but in grace welcomes us to draw near to him inside the veil. In chapter 3, Habakkuk prays to the Lord and asks him in his wrath to remember mercy. He recounts the mighty works of God in creation and in history. He concludes the book with a triumphant statement of his faith in the Lord. He describes what would be a farmer's nightmare. After all, good farmers diversify. So a poor result with one crop can be compensated for by a good result with another crop. But here he imagines a scenario where there are no figs or olives on the trees, no grapes on the vines, no crops in the field, no flocks in the fold, and no herd in the stall. What would he have left? Why, God, of course. And, says Habakkuk, I won't just trust in that situation, I will rejoice in the Lord. Now that's victory. And that's our scripture snapshot of the prophecy of Habakkuk.